Thank you. Several years ago, we were contacted by the Chief Inspector of Explosives in NRCAN in Ottawa, a man named Chris Watson. Chris called me and said, I'd like you to take a look at these new hand-loading regulations. They're doing a complete rewrite of the Explosives Act, and we've got some new regulations we'd like you to examine. And the first thing I looked at it and went, wow. No reloading ammunition within 200 meters of a dwelling house. And I went, huh? <laughs> I, so I got a hold of Mr. Watson and said, I don't know who wrote this, but this is insane. And he said, I thought you might think that, so let's start a dialogue. And that began a dialogue that lasted almost three years with Explosives Branch while we worked with them to bring in what we think are the best laws regarding ammunition and propellants anywhere in the free world. We have absolutely excellent laws. The gentleman who headed this up, his name is Patrick O'Neill. He's the Director General of Explosives Branch in NRCAN. Uh, we have been privileged to have Patrick at, at our uh, AGMs a number of times, and he's just an absolute fountain of information. We were so delighted to work with Patrick and his department because it was the first government department we'd ever worked with that didn't want to fight with us. They were actually trying to accomplish something good. They weren't trying to hurt the gun community. They were trying to help Canadians and do all this within the context of making things as easy for us as they possibly could. So please give a really warm welcome to like the best bureaucrat we've ever worked with. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Mr. Patrick O'Neill. Actually, Tony's getting older because uh, when that first set of draft uh, regulations was floated, um, that was a long time ago. Uh, oh. It's, I gotta set up, Tony is still hasn't stood up all day. Is that better? Okay. So that's a long time ago because actually, um, I don't, I don't want to speculate how young I was, but I grew up in a household where my father had a reloading press in the basement and I thought, what are those bureaucrats in Ottawa trying to do? Um, actually, the, the process to actually revise Canada's explosives regulations took the better part of 20 years. So uh, I think it's a little more than the three years Tony's referring to. Uh, certainly, um, um, but we've been active uh, since about 2013 with dealing with Tony and other shooting groups and uh, sportsmen's groups in the country. So let me uh, start by saying that uh, I'll skip over the outline because it's terribly long. Um, I will tell you a little bit about my organization and try to fit um, the sport shooting community inside of that. Um, I run the Explosive Safety and Security Branch, traditionally focused on worker safety and natural resource extraction sectors where you used explosives. So think mining, construction, forestry, agriculture, uh, you know, blowing stumps, that kind of thing. Um, and then we've added security, and that security aspect has come into predominance since 2001. Uh, we have the uh, Canada's Public Safety Act, and that was really a response to uh, a terror threat, uh, which is mentioned here on this first slide. Um, well, 9-11 and then, and then uh, chemical precursors in response to uh, the Toronto 18. Um, I think some people have uh, mocked at Ottawa's uh, reliance on data or facts. Uh, I do pride the fact that my organization um, is a, is a science-based and a fact-based decision-making uh, organization. Uh, we will entertain any points of view or argumentation so long as there is science to back up your position and we have a very good track record of, of actually working with many stakeholders and we do have many beyond the, 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 the interests in this room. Uh, to come up with more effective and, and uh, appropriate regulations. Uh, obviously, uh, we have to be mindful of the business uh, related to explosives. It is actually a big business in Canada. Uh, I maintain a list of <clears throat> authorized explosives for Canada. There are over 60,000 unique products listed on that list. 
Your product has to be listed on the ale, as I call it, the authorized list of explosives. Otherwise, you can't sell it, import it, vend it, or use it in Canada. So if you're a manufacturer, wholesaler, uh, retailer, it's important that your product is reflected on that list. Um, we regulate everything from toy pistol caps, uh, strike anywhere matches, uh, because they fit the definition of an explosives, which is a explosive or pyrotechnic effect that is anaerobic, so it does it with, without oxygen. Um, it's, a, it's based in chemistry. Um, and we regulate everything from those toy pistol caps, uh, take a light hand on that generally, uh, through automotive airbags, um, fastener cartridges, your Hilti type product, a rigid tool, you know, um, road flares, signal flares, uh, as well as commercial blasting explosives and military grade ordnance. So why do you regulate? Well, why do we regulate? So the Minister of Natural Resources is responsible for the Explosives Act and the associated uh, regulations. Um, the explosives regs complement other legal instruments governing the possession and use of explosives, such as Transport Canada's transportation of dangerous goods. All these products need to move either through marine, air, or uh, road transport forms. And the criminal code obviously makes references uh, to uh, the very illegal and inappropriate use of explosives. And actually, you need to have a provision in the explosives regulations to actually do anything with an explosive. The, uh, the initial position of the act is that everything explosive is outlawed unless there's a regulatory provision to bring it back into uh, legitimate use. And this includes import, manufacture, storage, transport, and retail sales. So I took this job six years ago probably time to move on in a, in a, a public servant's uh, lifetime in Ottawa. T typically people stay only for about three years, that way you're not accountable for your, your mistakes. Um, but uh, I, I've, I've overstayed uh, on, on that uh, uh, basis. But when I came here, we had a regulatory process, uh, regulatory amendment process underway. That's the thing that Tony was referring to. And uh, for the most part, the explosives regs were, quote unquote, my staff told me, pretty well written and ready to go. We learned a few things uh, as we got closer to show time, uh, particularly around part 14, which is uh, the primary interest uh, for, for the shooting community around small arms ammunition and propellants. Um, why were we doing a regulatory amendment process anyways? Well, our explosives regulations date back to about 1920. And they're actually based on circa 1860, 1880 British uh, framework that we simply adopted because that's what we did back in the day. Uh, and the only reason we started regulating explosives in Canada at that time was that, uh, and Mr. Breitkreitz will, will appreciate this, there was a dynamite factory in what was then Hull, Quebec, and it exploded and it took windows out of the back of the parliamentary library, I believe. Okay, so regulators said, oh, maybe we should do something here. Um, so anyways, we actually went through uh, Canada Gazette 1, Canada Gazette 2, and we introduced, uh, uh, I think, a fundamental restructuring of the explosives regulations in um, uh, 2013, and they actually entered into force uh, February 1st of 2014, and we've had several years now of implementation and there were phased uh, aspects that were on a phased implementation basis throughout uh, 2014 through 2016. I think it's important to note that uh, in 2015 we introduced screening, security screening that is, for factory and vendor magazines uh, for high risk explosives and that's in part eight and if you were a blaster or a, a, a an employee of one of the majors like Orica or Dino Nobel or Maxim, you'd really know what that's about. Uh, but we, for the first time, introduced uh, security screening against the CPIC system. So you have to have a criminal prior. We can actually deny somebody um, uh, a license uh, if you've got the right kind of conviction. Um, 
Prior to that, there was no requirement to be security screened for uh, possession of types I, E, and D explosives. I'll get into that in a, a little bit later. So in effect, prior to 2014, buying a box of 22 shells meant you had gone through uh, a more uh, strenuous security uh, background search than the guy buying p perhaps a five-ton truckload of, of uh, you know, uh, an ammonium nitrate uh, explosive. We also introduced in-transit shipping and export permitting for explosives. Up until then, Canada was only uh, interested in imports. So if you're on a manufacturing side of things and selling into the States, you now need an export permit. And I will say this is where the security aspect of what I do uh, enters into it. And this is uh, the first time where Canada can actually say X amount of explosives entered the country and X amount left. Prior to that, you know, if 20,000 pounds of something fell off of a truck, the reality was we didn't have data uh, to actually uh, be aware of that. Now we do. And then in 2016, uh, we uh, also uh, finalized uh, security screening for um, user magazines. And this is in the realm of commercial explosives. Okay, so for the average uh, person who owns small arms cartridges, um, I'll get into the definitions later. Uh, if you reload in your basement or your garage, uh, you uh, have to look at five parts of the regulations. They're very well written now. Uh, it's a 20, 20, uh, 20 parts. The first four are rules of general application and they apply to everybody who's handling an explosive. So. Uh, preliminary matters, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and I'll kind of walk through what's in each of those sections. And then there's a section uh, for uh, small arms ammunition and propellants. The rest of it is peripheral to your interests, presumably. Uh, there's a section on, on fireworks, there's a section on uh, manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing comes up if you're playing with uh, uh, branded products like Tannerite, though, so I'll get to that later. So uh, part one, you know, general matters, uh, talks about exemptions, defines some general terms, and it clarifies my relationship with the Department of Natural, uh, Natural Defense, of National Defense. Uh, I still have a role to play in the products that D&D uh, uses. Uh, if a man in a green suit is handling the explosives, I don't have anything to do with it. But if they hire contractors, for example, to uh, deal with unexploded ordnance. Uh, they're typically subcontractors now, and I actually regulate those individuals working uh, under the management, daily management of D&D. Um, there's uh, general requirements uh, regarding staff training. This is in the commercial realm. And then part three gets into authorization and classification, which kind of matters uh, for the shooting uh, community. Uh, really important that um, small arms ammunition or the components gets a classification of 1-4-S under the United Nations. That means you can actually go in the belly of a passenger airplane and that is by far the cheapest uh, mode of transport available uh, in the world today for this kind of product. Anything less than that starts uh, becoming a, a competitive disadvantage. Um, I guess just to show that not all public servants stick to old ways we actually abandoned the last point. We used to publish our list of authorized explosives. Again, 60,000 products. For the first time, we abandoned that. We post it like on an evergreen basis. You go to our website. There's a couple links involved in this deck later. You can, you can go to the URLs and find stuff. Uh, you know, I will admit I go on gun nuts, uh, not because I'm stalking you, but because I have a great trader rating. Okay? And... <laughs> and uh, I have a great trader rating. And, uh, you know, I see people saying, why can't I buy buffalo bore ammunition here? Uh, or whatever. Uh, it's because nobody in the, in the private sector who's got a commercial interest in here has brought buffalo bore in for authorization at my, at my lab, which, which is involved in those classification decisions, okay? And it's not as hard as uh, people would think um, we do a lot of authorizations by, um, by reference. So for the most part, 
ammunitions coming out of the European world uh, or out of the United States. Uh, we, ha we know the reputation of federal ATK or Winchester Olin and, and it's not like you're coming to us with a new product per se. Where, where we actually have to do testing um, is if you're a small manufacturer, perhaps you want to sell reloaded ammunition, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I, I like to say to people, if you get your product on that authorized list, it is a bit of a license to print money. So the, the, the outlay to get uh, approved isn't, isn't actually, um, shouldn't be a detriment. I just want to, on this slide, say that uh, part four deals with import, export, and in-transit movement. Uh, the old regs were very difficult to interpret, um, and I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit later in a, in a very much more user-friendly table. But basically, up until 2014, if you were reloading ammunition, you were not legally or lawfully allowed to drive to the gun range with that round of ammunition in your vehicle uh, because there was not uh, a classification to allow that. Uh, we changed that, or I helped change that. Um, but it was happening, everybody was doing it, and you'll remember my reference, you know, kid in Sudbury used to go to the Garston shooting range with, and, and pop off a lot of reloaded ammunition, and that was with a police officer who thought he was probably doing nothing wrong either. So we got rid of a lot of gray areas. Uh, manufacturing doesn't really apply, it doesn't apply to a reloader, okay? Uh, where it will come back up in my presentation is the reference to binary or reactive target kits, which is a form of manufacturing. Magazines and licenses, I'll get into the details, but in part six, I don't imagine there's anybody here who has their own magazine license because the amounts of ammunition uh, are actually fairly extensive. Maybe, maybe some of the retail people will. Uh, but, you know, we'll issue uh, uh, a magazine license to an individual or a retailer, and I believe you pay $70 for my license, or no more than 90 something like that. Um, but then you're actually open to being inspected by an NRCAN inspector. And, and if you could just hold off uh, with the question, if you're, an, if, you're, if you're not a licensed manufacturer, if you're not a licensed uh, magazine holder or user, uh, my inspectorate does not come knocking on your door to uh, do a check on whether you're actually respecting or you're regulatory compliant with, with the regulations. Uh, if you could hold your question, I think I got a lot to go through and I'm, I'll probably answer the question. Um, we also introduced um, fire safety and security plans for what we call high hazard sites. And those are sites that are uh, dealing with type D, E, and I explosives. I like to flip it over and call it IEDs. It's easier to remember. <laughs> but, but I is initiation systems. This is in the realm of commercial explosives. Okay, so debt cord, boosters, blasting caps, that kind of thing. E is commercial explosives. Could be anything from dynamite to ammonium nitrate emulsion, et cetera. And type D is military and law enforcement. I'm going to skip this because it's probably not where your interests lie. I think for screening, I, I will touch on it. Um, <clears throat> again, I said you were subject to more uh, security screening buying a box of ammunition prior to uh, February 1st, 2014 than you were for uh, commercial explosives. We introduced screening requirements for uh, types E, I, and D, uh, which I've referred to already. Uh, so as to not create a regulatory burden, we've accepted a lot of other uh, screening tools as a fungible representation of your uh, honesty. So the FAST a uh, card issued by CBSA, Nexus for uh, pre-border clearance, again by CBSA. If you had an existing PAL or RPAL, you're demonstrating uh, that you're uh, a good, good citizen and or shouldn't, shouldn't be a, a risk with uh, types E, I, and D. Uh, and in Quebec, uh, I'm not sure how many francophones I have here, monsieur, okay. Uh, 
Quebec, La Belle Province, has something they call the Permis General, uh, which is a very robust explosives controls framework. It's in response to the FLQ crisis. And uh, the reality is the, the world is only getting um, nastier, for lack of a better term. Um, and again, my organization deals with security issues. And, you know, like it or not, small arms ammunition and propellants are an explosive. So you're, you're, you're involved in my regs and the details that I'm going to show you in a few minutes really matter and I want you guys to know what you need to do in terms of amounts and limits and storage requirements so that you are compliant. Um, I will take uh, a different view than Tony. Um, if you get involved with another form of uh, regulatory officer, it can cost you a lot of money. So why not just you know, respect the laws, know the laws, and uh, you're flying, uh, you know, like very easy peasy, if you will. Um, and we'll support you, uh, you know, stakeholders, you're our stakeholders. Police are our stakeholders as well, but we tell people, here's what the regulatory requirements are, and they're that, and they're nothing else, okay? And that, uh, I think, sets us apart from, from uh, some of your other friends. I'm just gonna touch on part 20. It's important to know the breadth of what what I'm responsible for. So in response to Toronto 18, so this was 1999, I guess, 2000, we introduced uh, a list of 10 chemicals um, into the regulations. These are called precursor chemicals. You know, you can go on YouTube, you can find uh, homemade explosive videos, demos, uh, using a lot of household products. A lot of the products are uh, benign consumer products, depending on their concentration levels. But if you get to a certain concentration level, mix it with the right thing and have an initiation system, you can make a bomb. And actually, uh, we've seen you know, a fair bit of that in Canada. Fortunately, not as much as in Europe uh, over the last two years. Uh, but certainly for anybody in Western Ontario, like yourself, John, uh, Mr. Mr. Strathroy, uh, you know, he was dealing with something that's not even on this list. Um, so um, he was an innovative little bugger. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, the, the point is um, we're, we're not doing a lot going forward vis-a-vis -vis small arms ammunition or propellants. Uh, but we will be doing more and actually it was referenced in the budget 2017 that um, you know uh, the legislators want us to deal with more increasingly broader list of chemicals that are, are being seen uh, time and time again uh, both in Canada and globally uh, for, for people who have uh, terroristic uh, tendencies. It's just, a, it's just a trivia piece for for you guys. So I talked about consultation with uh, the shooting community prior to um, getting the regulatory amendments through. Uh, I got the job, I was told, hey, don't worry, we've consulted with CSSA, we've consulted with the NFA. Um, this is Tony comes in on cue. I'm thinking this is easy peasy, my staff have done a great job. And then we went into Canada Gazette 1 and uh, Tony Bernardo went apoplectic on me uh, because uh, there were references to ammunition storage in the regulations. And I think it's important to say, uh, I think the regs read very well, the modern regs read very clearly and concisely. Uh, the problem with that 1920 circa 1860 document that we had is that you almost had to be a lawyer uh, to understand what your, your legal requirements were. Things were inferred but not legally clear and I think in the matter of law it has to be black and white so there are no gray areas so people can actually comply. Um, but actually what Tony and I ended up having a lot of face time over was the simple transferring or transposing of the previous regulatory requirements for storage into the new regs. So you can consult, you can talk to people. I always have to caution myself, was I heard and did the person I was talking to hear what I said? Uh, so I, I think I've heard somebody tell me I should say this presentation three times uh, just a while ago. Uh, I'm teasing. But um, you know, we made 
uh, sorry, we made a lot of, um, hmm. okay, I'm probably going back one too many. So we made a lot of fundamental changes to uh, this particular part of the regs. Uh, we did that in consultation with SAMI, which is Small Arms Ammunition Manufacturing Institute of the United States. Uh, we do a lot of work with them. CSSA, Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, National Firearms Association, the Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation, which I presume this facility is a member of, of that association, uh, as well as the W... Uh, the WFSSSA, which is the World Forum on the Future of Sport Shooting Activities. Um, they're a recognized UN group, if you will. Uh, they speak about reloading regulations, hunting, etc. cetera. Um, so we dealt, uh, I don't even know how many meetings between Canada Gazette 1 and Canada Gazette 2. Uh, certainly the period between one and two took a lot longer than I was anticipating. I think it was 14 months and this one section of the regulations was the was the issue. Um, and uh, you know I had to do that as a public servant working through my political masters so uh, it wasn't as straightforward as, as uh, you know project management would tell you. I think the key points are we did revise the storage requirements. I'll get into that a little bit better. But we went from protects from theft to not given unlimited access. And I'll speak to that in a little more detail. We also changed what is the maximum caliber reference of a small arms ammunition. Um, previously, it had been set at 50 caliber. Everybody said, well, what about a 505 Gibbs or a 577 Snyder? And I mean, they're ubiquitous in Ontario. And I went, oh, yeah, you're right. So a bit of a bit of an issue there. Uh, so what we did do is we aligned Canada's uh, explosives regulations with the UN uh, with all its warts and unpopularity depending on the on the day uh, the UN has a, a 75 caliber uh, definition so uh, we'll, we'll get into that comparison later. Uh, we uh, there was a reference to tracers I think I've been uh, ta uh, taken on this one before uh, we, we've done a, we, we still have a reference to a military uh, type uh, ammunition, uh, but we've taken tracer out of that definition. So if you can come up with a low heat tracer, uh, send it to my lab, and if it doesn't present a forest fire risk, we'll actually authorize it. It's hard to do. It's not economically perhaps viable, certainly when you get Romanian and Czech uh, tracer ammo uh, by the boatload for nothing, um, but we do have a public safety uh, role to play, and uh, uh, there have been, you know, a lot of uh, fire-related issues that we've been uh, we've been lobbied uh, with, you know, either by fire departments, provinces, etc. So it's an issue that uh, we still have to grapple with, um, and I, I would say we also allowed for the first time. Uh, legally, a lot of stuff's happened in Canada illegally. Let's put it that way. Products coming in across a porous border, um, and the border is still very porous. But we also allowed for the first time bulk ammunition, and uh, uh, it's called limited quantities. But uh, f certainly for commercial, the commercial aspect of of uh, this the sector, that that matters somewhat. So part fourteen. Go to, when you go online, you got to know part 14. It's really the only part that you really, really need to be well versed in. And I will stress, and that's why it's underlined and bolded, this is for activities not requiring a license, a permit, or a certificate. Okay? So through the consultative process, we heard from uh, stakeholders that the quantity of uh, reloading propellants stored in a dwelling or uh, in a storage unit, they wanted that clarified and maybe some, some liberations made. Um, ironically, the old regulations was, was really phobic, if you will, about uh, the number of primers, down to the point where it talked about the number of primers in a loading machine. Um, so I ended up calling Dillon Manufacturing and saying, how big of a, of a primer tube can I get for my Dillon 
you know, XL 550. So I don't even know why the old regs referred to that to the amounts they did because there's no commercial uh, primer tube and I thought Dillon was the best benchmark in the industry. So we clarified that because you could be breaking the law under the old regulatory regime if you left a certain amount of primers in the tube. And I, I don't recall what that number was, I just think it shows how badly it was, was written. Um, we've made differentiations between black and smokeless powders. Uh, we've made differentiations between whether you're in a single family home or living in a condo in downtown Vancouver. Um, we changed the total amounts to propellants and primers stored indoors. We provided that generic uh, classification for transport so you can actually lawfully take your reloading, uh, your reloaded rounds down the road and, to, and, and fire them off. Uh, and we did add uh, cl clarity around the fact that vendors of propell propellants need to enroll with NRCAN. All that means is we need to know who you are because, because you can be um, in retail uh, without a magazine. You know, it's, 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 it gets complicated quickly. So at least we'd like to know who you are, right? So I'll do previous regs, new regulations. And you'll have to go picking like a chicken <coughs> through the regs to get this. You won't see this table, but I left the deck uh, with Mike. So, you know, talk to Tony or somebody else at CSSA to get a copy if you're, if you're interested. So the old regs talked about a reasonable quantity. And I, I think uh, the journalist, uh, the 22 year old journalist made some comment about preppers. This one was interesting. The old regs talked about 225 kilograms net explosives quantity. So that was the other thing that uh, I think a lot of shooting groups didn't understand. Uh, either what the NEQ meant or that it was actually in the old regulations because again they were so poorly written. So NEQ means basically the amount of powder that's in a primer which is very minuscule but it's a it's a primary explosive. Uh, as well as the propellant, whether it's smokeless or of a black powder variety. So this is the weight of the explosive in a cartridge. So net of the projectile, net of the brass case or steel case, okay? What does that translate into? Well, approximately 2.8 million rounds of 22 long rifle, 40, 46,000 rounds of 300 wind mag or 30-06. I mean, this is a little more of an estimate on my part or about 100,000 12-gauge shotgun shells, okay? So we did face some pushback. Some people wanted no limit. Um, the United States doesn't have a limit. Um, I wasn't certainly given a mandate to revise the regs so that we looked more like the United States. But again, this is for unlicensed, right? So each and every one of you could own that, you know, those equivalents uh, without having a license, which means you're not being inspected. I can say, though, that in three years of implementing and administering these new regulations, there's a lot of people who don't like even this amount. It works out to 737,000 40 Okay. Will that get you through the weekend? It I know you shoot IPSC. <laughs> I know you shoot IPSC, but uh, it's, it's, it's probably even good for you, okay? Um, and I think the other important thing uh, to note is that the old regs didn't even make it clear, you know, with certainty whether you could actually keep a box of hunting ammunition in your house. So this is a quantum improvement over what we had, okay? Uh, here's the next issue. Old regs said when cartridges are kept in a store, a warehouse, or a container, You'll see it didn't say dwelling. So a dwelling is a, is, is a uh, structure meant for inhabitation by a human. And the old regs didn't actually make the reference to a dwelling. So you had to keep your ammunition in a store, a warehouse, or a container, which means set like a garden shed or something. Um, and it needed to be securely closed and locked. Uh, where we went, ended up going with a lot of interaction with CSSA and Department of Justice lawyers uh, was a, re a provision which refers to not give unlimited access, okay? Uh, what that means is um, 
I'm a relatively tall guy. I've got a four-year-old in my house. Um, pretty soon it'll be a grandkid, not my own. They're, they're as big as I am. But for analogy, I put my ammunition on the top shelf of a closet, okay? It's out of, it's out of the reach of the child, and I leave for work and I lock my door, okay? That actually pass, passes the test for DOJ that you've not given unlimited access to the ammunition. So I know the Firearms Act says other stuff. I think I don't, I'm not here to talk or apologize or whatever for, for something I'm not responsible for. But certainly the Firearms Act leads you to read, you have to have it in a locked container away from your firearms, is how I would read it, okay? But as far as the Explosives Act and the Explosives Regulations go, this passes muster, not giving unlimited access. Um, as per uh, Regulation 2, tracers, incendiary, high explosives or other military, um, other similar military cartridges are excluded from what's called a safety cartridge. So basically we've re rewritten it to say um, tracers will be allowed when confirmed uh, to be safe for use through testing and, and that is safe from a, a fire, um, fire prevention point of view uh, and it's actually illegal to buy um, you know an incendiary or uh, exploding um, projectile and do and reload those and I haven't even seen those on gun nuts so I, I, I think we're we're covering off something that that's probably very outside normal normal parameters um, although I do see tracers for sale all the time um, 50 caliber uh, was the old reference and now we've aligned at 19.1 or 75 caliber uh, which is with the U per the UN definition um, and ironically the United States still uses the 50 caliber uh, reference. So a 20 millimeter lackey is outside your purview? Uh, correct. Okay. So yeah. Where does that land? Uh, that would not be deemed a, um, a small arms cartridge. Um, the 20 mil laddies. Uh, Not that I have one. No, well, I saw, I saw great billet aluminum cartridges for one the other day on gun nuts. Uh, you're into something else, you know. It's not, a, it's not a conventional small arm. doesn't fit the UN definition. Um, that doesn't mean uh, it, it couldn't be authorized. Uh, but these stuff, I mean, I can't prevent somebody from turning something off on their, their, their aluminum lathe, you know. Uh, but, but that is not a small arms uh, weapon, if you will. Um, I'd think twice before I'd get into one, you know, because uh, law enforcement does enforce my regulations and my act, and they're going to say, well, you've got something that's not a firearm, right? But I don't know where, where the gray area is actually on cannons, so I, I don't want to take from that. I'd, I'd be willing to have a conversation with anybody about that, I kind of like a cannon myself, but, uh, <laughs> but you're, you're getting into a different world of hurt, if you, if you know what I'm saying. Um, there were no exemptions for transport. Uh, I told you about that exemption for transport, and we also went further. So UN numbers 12, 14, 44, and 55 relate to um, primers, um, primed, cartridges, blanks, and um, cartridge, uh, like unprimed cartridge cases. Uh, again, it was a bit of a gap in the uh, previous set of regs. Okay, propellants. Everybody asks about propellants. Previous regs said 10 kgs may be stored in a dwelling, which is ironic because it didn't let you store your loaded ammunition with any clarity. But again, there was a lot of legal interpretation. So what we went to was 25 kgs of smokeless powder in a single unit dwelling. In that same single unit dwelling, you're gonna have 25 kgs of powder, not more of which, not more than 10 of which could be black powder. Um, I will say that we were lobbied uh, for this. Um, I am, disagreed with 10 kgs of black powder. 
Uh, I run a science lab. I know way too much about ammunition and behavior of, of a lot of explosives. Um, I would say it's the most imprudent thing anybody in this room could do. I have a great video of one, kilo, uh, one pound of black powder exploding and uh, you know it will, it will kill. Uh, you will certainly die and uh, it will probably blow the average bedroom out of a bungalow in Saskatoon. Like, I don't think they use brick here either, so uh, I can't imagine how, what, the, what the spread's gonna be like, but uh, it's, a, it's an awful lot of black powder. Um, then we go to multi-units, so 20 kilograms of smokeless, um, if kept in containers of one kilogram or less. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's a five kilogram total if you're going to do the big, the big jug of Vargit because you got a good price on it. And this is actually about, um, you know, the tendency of things to, to you know, detonate and spread. Um, it's a behavior we do for testing for transportation issues on other explosives. And uh, that's why you got little paper liners in your ammunition box, you know, for the most part. It's as simple as that. Packaging for explosives matters uh, once they start um, detonating or burning. It's a, it's a means of containment. Um, and then we make and one, um, one kilogram of black powder in containers or three kilograms of black powder in cartridges or, or uh, like a, a cartouche, so like a, a linen or paper uh, type uh, if you're in the reenacting crowd. Uh, 75 kilograms of propellant may be kept uh, in a detached store. Remember, a store is not a dwelling, which allows for human inhabitation. So the new regs read explicitly, if you're in a single family home, you can keep 25 kgs in your basement or your reloading room if your wife lets you reload on the main floor and you can have another 75 kilograms in a detached store. So you, you, you can have a maximum amount of smokeless of 100 kilograms without needing a permit, okay? Um, in terms of sales, uh, we changed uh, some of the nuancing in the prov uh, that provision to basically say your seller, if you're a seller, you need to be enrolled and you need to actually either take just the PAL number of a person who purchases, and it's just the number. So Patrick O'Neill and whatever my number is, you don't need an address, you don't need anything. Or if you don't have a, a, a firearms license, then I need, you know, full name, number, address, etc. Why do we do that? Um, unfortunately, the Canadian Bomb Data Center is no longer functioning, but um, in a, on a North American scale, the amount of black powder and smokeless powder that's used as propellants and pipe bombs is staggering, okay? And uh, I don't imagine anybody here is making pipe bombs, at least that you're going to admit to it. Um, everybody's had a drunken night, but... Um, there are a lot of people who use these same products to do bad things, okay? And that's the reality. Um, and I think perhaps important to remember that when you're having discussions or debates or arguments with other regulators. Uh, this isn't about legitimate use, but, but this is about uh, preventing uh, illegal misuse. For part nine, which is transportation, carrier or a driver, so a shipper or, or its driver is not subject to the requirements of Part 9 if they don't transport more than 12 kilograms of black powder or 150 kgs of smokeless. Any quantity of 0012, 0014, or 0044. And I still know that the likes of Canpar really make uh, shipping ammunition expensive. It's not my fight to take on. Um, I either buy local or, or, or uh, yeah, I use Canada Post. Um, but, but, you know, when you deal with a retailer and they say it's going to cost you this much, uh, I would actually, so I'm looking at uh, Mr. Hipwell here, I would actually have, you know, encourage you to take this up with Canpar because I think they're still, they're probably unaware. We are dealing with uh, transport uh, sector more and more. 
uh, but I still think they like the premium prices that they were getting off a very low, low hazard um, uh, product being shipped. So I'm going to touch on reactive targets. Uh, I've been to, this is my third CSSA event. Uh, I think the last time we had just actually allowed these for a lawful use in Canada. I, I do want to say that uh, there's been a lot of misuse of this, so uh, I, won't, I won't say that uh, I, we won't be revisiting it if uh, the shenanigans continue, okay? So let me start by saying that prior uh, to Explosives Regs 2013, uh, products such as the Tannerite brand were coming into Canada. In the United States, actually, uh, the FBI, not so much, but ATF is actually envious of the approach that we've taken in this set of regulations because it's not classified as an, explosives in the, as an explosive in the United States. And we can all go on YouTube and see all kinds of horrific stupidity. Okay, and I think I said I can't regulate stupidity. So I really, really want people to listen. And if you're in retailer, retail, I, you know, I really want you to encourage your, your consumers to, to use it in the prescribed lawful manner because we have removed products from the marketplace, okay? And sometimes the stuff that comes to our attention is too hard to debate. And remember, I said I was fact-based, and when you're presented with enough facts, sometimes you have to react. So um, we um, did have a very convoluted way of having uh, binary kits available in Canada. You either had to have a manufacturing license under Part 5 or you had to have a firework <laughs> operator certificate. What we did with ER 2013 is allowed these kits to come into the country or be manufactured in the country uh, in a not pre-assembled way but in their comp with the components provided in the kit. Um, we also took decisions on the size of the product that we would authorize. You're only allowed to use it in its maximal form of one pound. So if you combine them and make a videotape where you're blowing off 20 pounds, I do encourage law enforcement at whatever level, lay a charge under the act and the regs. I mean, it's that simple. Uh, it's black and white. And uh, because it's, it's those people who are doing that that are going to actually have force, force me and my organization to remove this product from the marketplace. Okay, so I'm welcoming the opportunity that Tony's provided because I have to give a clear message. If people keep continuing to misuse the product, it will be removed from the authorized list. Okay, there's a lot of people watching us as shooters. Okay, and if you're going to be stupid, put your video camera away or your cell phone away. I mean, you gotta be one, be, be, be unlawful and, and, and smart or follow the rules. Like, it, you can't have it both ways. Some guys in Tulsburg near my house just set off a tannerite bomb that was shaking windows 10 kilometers away. And they thought it was funny. Okay. So it puts this man in a terrible position. So, you've heard my, 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 uh, my, my plea, you're supposed to follow the safety instructions and they're only supposed to be used for their intended purpose, which is to go to a shooting range if they'll permit you, if they'll permit you, um, or to your own private property and use it up to that one pound. And I can tell you, you know, a lot of the issues are being resolved at the municipal level for me because they're creating bylaws. Okay, and let me be really clear, my, my regulations always defer to another local jurisdiction having a, a, a authorization, okay? So we regulate fireworks, but in, I guess, uh, South Vancouver, lots of problems with kids goofing around, and there's a lot of product offerings that are not even available in that market, okay? And we will actually go and inspect and, and you know, uh, uh, write up a vendor if they're selling a product that they're not supposed to have in that particular geographic uh, market, okay? 
Um, the summary of the reg regulatory requirements are, are outlined there. I will go on to say that the misuse has been going on for a while. Uh, we issued uh, a regulatory reminder in 2016. I know I shared it with Tony. We shared it with a lot of people who had uh, magazine licenses for this product. Uh, but basically, you know, the kit has to be authorized. The, the mixing of the aluminum powder and uh, ammonium nitrate needs to be done at the uh, location of use. And to buy it, you need to have a, uh, a license issued under the Firearms Act or a Firework Operator Certificate. Um, you need an import permit if you want to bring this stuff into the country. There's no, there's no real consumer use. This is, a, this is a, an explosive uh, in the truest form, unlike sporting arms ammunition, which kind of gets a pass, though it's an explosive because it's a 1-4-S, so I don't want to get into UN classification, but you do need an import permit. And uh, actually, when we do our authorizations, uh, I can tell you very uh, uh, openly, we're rejecting products that have a high amount of chlorates in it. Once you start getting into chlorates, you start getting into, you know, um, I want to commit a terrorist act. So those are very sensitive and very detonable products. Uh, uh, chemical formulations when you start getting into um, chlorates. Um, so suffice it to say I've enjoyed working with uh, all the membership of CSSA and other groups who conduct themselves in a nice fact-based and uh, professional manner. Um, CSSA does get good marks for that. Uh, all the communications have been excellent so I appreciate that Tony and others. Uh, again, I've harped on about evidence. We'll look at all the facts all the time. Uh, I think what we've learned since 2013 is that we need to be more of a regulator and get into the regulatory process more often and more frequently. So um, I will be doing a Canada Gazette uh, 1 and 2 for um, issues pertaining to loading and unloading of commercial explosives or at ports and wharves in Canada this year and we'll probably be doing more because I have to add more chemicals to my list that I need to keep out of the hands of, of people with bad intent. Um, and with that, I would take questions and you have my new voice over internet protocol phone number and I've been email transformed. So yeah, I'm Patrick O'Neill at Canada.ca.